So the, um, once we were done with the uh, on-orbit tuning of the parameters and the ground processing tuning, we worked um, on doing a radiometric calibration um, on orbit um, to compare to what we got on the ground. And we compared to ABI. Uh, we decided ABI uh, did enough work on their calibration that they must be truth. And we um, compared to their um, full disk images in two different bands, the veggie band and the red band, uh, those bracket our band of 777.4 uh, nanometers. So you can see on the x-axis there's uh, the ABI radiance, and on the y-axis is our GLM radiance uh, for cloud uh, pixels. This doesn't work for other pixels. You have to have um, a cloud pixel um, because you're comparing two different wavelengths. And you uh, see the green line is where um, all of the points would be if we were perfect. Um, so you can see uh, the deviation from that is our calibration error. And we're thinking it's between 10 to um, a very good uh, calibration. And since the um, event calibration is based on the background calibration, we think the event calibration is, uh, is very good. We also did um, a navigation cross calibration. We did uh, car aeronautics, astronautics, uh, did a uh, verification using ABI backgrounds because uh, uh, they used ABI navigation as truth. ABI is doing all kinds of great work with calibration navigation that we are completely taking advantage of. And, um, and then uh, Philip Bitzer at UAH also did a comparison to um, the uh, ground networks, and uh, Katrina Vitz also did some uh, really great work that, I'm, that she's going to talk about next uh, with navigation also. So we meet our requirement of about half a pixel. Now I know some of you have worked with level two data over the past uh, year and may disagree with my um, assertion that we meet our requirement because there were a lot of navigation errors in the uh, ground processing. Um, but we found those bugs and eliminated them, so the data that's going to start flowing apparently within the hour is um, going to have much better navigation. We're gonna ha we may have to wait a couple days for the navigation solution to converge, but after that we will have very good navigation that uh, we have not seen in the official level two data up to this point. So. GLM has taken a lot of data. Uh, we, take, we see about one and a half million flashes every day. We have seen about 18 billion lightning events since I wrote this chart, which was a few days ago, so probably more than that now, because um, they just turned us back on and goes east, so we've got some more. Um, so we did some uh, trending. We can look at diurnal and seasonal trends. And so on the, the plot you see there on the x-axis is hour of the day. Um, and on the y-axis is month of the year, starting with January at the top. It only goes to November because we didn't have uh, data from December because we were drifting. So the, uh, you can see that, uh, and the color is the uh, total lightning signal um, that we get at the GLM entrance people. So you can see that lightning happens in August at uh, late afternoon. So for those of you out there wanting to go find the the coolest data. Apparently, that's where it is. Um, the middle of the night is not uh, early. Very early in the morning is not as interesting. So we can, with this huge data set, we can look at some. Um, we can dive in and look at just a couple of seconds of data. On the right, on the left is um, there's a cascade of flashes that uh, through Oklahoma. You can see the outline of Oklahoma there. And uh, first you saw it with persistence on, and then how GLM saw it um, in, uh, in real time. And then on the right uh, is a week's worth of data of South America <coughs> over Thanksgiving. And so you can look at um, how weather develops over several days. We've got persistent, uninterrupted data um, for uh, tracking weather over multiple days, which we have not had uh, from space before. Uh, in terms of lightning. I'll let you finish watching the cool movie. <laughs> so, 
The, um, another thing we have uh, the value of GLM is to be able to um, give you timely and reliable information in order to support severe weather prediction. So this, uh, we took a look at, um, at storm system over Texas on um, let me get, April 29th, and we looked at this one tornadic storm cell and looked at, um, you can see the flash rate in green and the power, total power in blue, and you can see where the EF4 tornado touchdown uh, was reported at uh, 2240, and you can see very clearly an increase in flash rate and uh, total uh, event, uh, lightning event power uh, about half an hour to 40 minutes before the, uh, the tornado touchdown. So this is a very clear indication that the lightning data is gonna help with uh, severe weather prediction. And um, one of the other applications of GLM is to help with um, flight planning. Mm -hmm. So you can see here, this is the Midwest. Those are um, various airports. And the little um, kind of orangey pink dots are uh, airplanes. This is time lapse. The airplanes don't actually go that fast, or we'd all <laughs> get places way faster. Um, so you can see that um, the airplanes are avoiding the convective weather. And uh, this is an after the fact um, data um, mashup, if you will. And, um, but this is something that would be used in real time uh, to, put, to help do uh, planning of um, flight paths and being able to uh, not have to go all the way around convective weather uh, be able to know where the danger is. So the goes east data is going to be um, flowing apparently before the end of this uh, uh, session and uh, we'll be getting great data just like this uh, from goes east and uh, goes s is launching on march 1st so we will uh, then have two satellites in orbit um, giving us uh, really great lightning data for the next uh, 10 to 15 years thank you very much uh, i always like to take at least one question anybody have a question from the audience i should clarify since Sam, Samantha says the data's flowing. It's not flowing to no. all of you. It's only flowing <laughs> to the calibration working group. Uh, we have a uh, review on January 19th that Bill Koshak will lead the presentation, which we call our provisional validation review. And if GLM passes that, then it gets put on the operational system after that. So I would guess if that works on January 22nd, then the world will have access to GLM. Yeah, go ahead. Two questions. So yes, we do see bolides. Uh, we've been working with a team from Ames uh, Research Center to, uh, they're using the data, uh, the level two data to search for bolides. Um, and uh, we've seen some spectacular um, light curves from, I was going to show them, but you know, with 12 minutes, you don't have a lot of time, but they are uh, some spectacular light curves with, uh, especially with our two millisecond cadence for events, uh, we can really see the breakup and um, the initial um, high uh, altitude um, signal. And in terms of a gridded product, you have to talk to uh, Scott Rudlowski about that. But there are plans to uh, try and create a gridded product uh, that makes sense for the uh, weather service. All right, thank you. Hey, thank thank you. our speaker. <laughs> our next speaker, uh, Katrina Wirtz. Um, let's see, I gotta swap you to a Mac. Okay, so Katrina Wirtz will be presenting uh, cross um, referencing GLM and ISS Liz with ground based lightning networks. Thank you. 
Let's get the burger. Thank you. Um, well, as I mentioned, I'll be talking about some cross-referencing we've done with GLM and Liz with ground-based Latin networks, and this is work I'm doing with uh, Rich Blakesley and Steve Goodman, who are up here, and Bill Koshak, who is probably somewhere in the audience. Um, uh, so Sam already gave quite a bit of background on GLM, so I'm not going to go that much into that, and we've already talked a bit about the timeline. Um, I'll just note that for the first year of its life, um, from November 19th through um, just a uh, couple weeks ago, uh, GLM was in uh, test position around 89 and a half degrees west, so the black outlined uh, region that you see here was the nominal field of view. Uh, the most recent ground system update um, that prior to this talk was on uh, November 28th. Um, and then the transition to goes east, it's already been covered, so now the field of view is what's shown in red nominally. Um, and the information there about the, the provisional and full validation reviews that are upcoming. Um, in addition, um, another lightning sensor was put in space in the last year was a lightning imaging sensor, LIZ. Um, that name is familiar, it should be, because um, there was a lightning imaging sensor that flew on TRIM that uh, was launched in 1997 and provided about uh, 17 years of data in um, sampling tropical convection. Um, this is the flight spare for LIZ. Um, it was um, identical instrument. It was kept in storage for years, uh, taken out, tested, and it is now flying on the International Space Station. It was launched on February 19th. Um, the International Space Station is in low Earth orbit, about 425 kilometers, which is similar to the altitude that TRIM flew. Um, this gives a field of view of about 600 kilometers by 600 kilometers. Um, the orbit of the International Space Station also has a larger inclination, so that um, instead of seeing just the tropics as TRIM did, um, Liz is now able to sample up to about 54 degrees latitude. Um, so this is great for comparison and, and, and calibration, comparing um, the two space-based uh, lightning observations um, from GLM and Liz. And this also extends the global record of lightning observations from space around the world. Um, the information I'll be showing today is based on provisional data from Liz. Um, this will be publicly available within the next uh, month or so. Uh, for both these instruments, um, the basic observation is um, just illuminated pixels. So these are called events, um, single pixels where the illumination exceeds a background level in a particular frame, two millisecond frame. Um, there's a clustering algorithm run at level two, and I'll just run through that briefly. Um, the uh, event data is clustered into groups. So these are just adjacent events within the two, same two millisecond frame, identifying the whole area illuminated uh, by a lightning discharge within the, uh, the particular frame. Uh, the groups are then clustered into flashes, um, both spatially and temporally, so the windows used are 330 uh, milliseconds and then five and a half kilometers for Liz, 16 and a half kilometers for GLM, um, the difference there being the difference in the instrument um, resolution. Uh, my comparisons will be with data from two uh, ground-based networks, um, one of which is Earth Network's Global Lightning Network, or ENGLN. Um, this is an uh, LFHF lightning detection network, so it detects total lightning. Um, they have a number of sensors in the U.S. and also scattered through the um, rest of the Americas. Um, in addition, um, ENGLN also includes um, strokes from the Worldwide Lightning Location Network, which is a VLF network. Um, so this gives lightning coverage in areas that are uh, more remote from the Earth Network sensors. Um, the second data set that I'll be comparing with is the Global Lightning Data Set, or GLD360, from Vaisala. Uh, this is also a VLF uh, lightning detection network, so it's seen primarily cloud-to-ground flashes, um, and it has uh, high detection efficiency in um, the field that we're, um, that we're examining. The matching that I'm doing between um, satellite and ground-based data sets is based on just spatial and temporal windows, um, looking for um, close matches. Um, and the um, windows, the size of the windows that I'm using is based on experience um, with what the 
um, observed variability is. So for GLM, after you correct for the time of um, flight, so that means for the time that it takes lightning to travel from the Earth's atmosphere up to the satellite, after that correction is performed, the timing um, is, is very close to what we would see of the ground-based network. So there I use a pretty narrow averaging window. For LIS, um, we had some timing issues early on that have to do with the, um, the system timing of the International Space Station. Um, that has actually been um, fixed, and, and so we're um, seeing much accurate, more accurate timing now, but that's why I'm using a larger window at this point. Um, the plan is to narrow that down. All right, so on to actual data. This is, um, I'm overlaying data for um, a convective event in um, a portion of southeastern Brazil. Uh, Rio de Janeiro is um, in this area. And this is um, during the time of one Liz overpass, so this is about five minutes of total data. Uh, and so overlaid here are the um, ISS Liz flashes in, um, or excuse me, groups in uh, red X's. And um, you can see that those are um, pretty well located with the um, flashes or flash data from the ground networks, the Earth networks in GLD360. Um, the GLM uh, groups, which are shown in the black X's, are um, spatial pattern is similar, but they're just located a bit south. Um, and this is because of, um, this data is from November 28th, which is after the most recent ground system update, but as I mentioned, there has to be a multi-day averaging um, for the INR process to really pinpoint the geolocation. And so with only a couple days worth of observations before the um, satellite was put in safe mode for the shift east, um, there was an opportunity for that to be fully done. So this should be improving with the new data that's um, available soon. Okay, so starting with Liz, um, I'm showing here the temporal offsets between Liz and um, the various reference networks. And you can see that for each uh, reference source considered, there's this um, spike in the uh, distribution right around zero. Um, so um, sub-millisecond timing accuracy, regardless of which reference network we're comparing to. Um, and this is also, um, th I should say, this is based on the first six months of data from um, provisional data from Liz. So this is March through the end of August. Um, you can also look at the timing behavior over time. So here um, I've divided each Liz orbit into 30 second intervals and calculated the histogram of temporal offsets in each 30 second period. And then if there has a, a distinct peak there, I'm, I'm plotting that as a function of time. So this goes from um, March at the left all the way through August at the right. And so you can see that um, the timing is, is generally stable. Um, the points are clustered right around zero. There are two excursions that are, are being looked into, um, one about 20 milliseconds off here in late May, and then another um, about 10 milliseconds off in, in late July. But in general, the timing is stable. Um, for geolocation, um, there are two different methods of used to uh, help geolocate the LIS data. Um, one is um, the star tracker, which is a, um, co-located with LIS on the Inter International Space Station and has very accurate pointing. Um, when that is used, then the spatial offset distribution um, peaks around five to six kilometers, uh, with the tail then toward, um, toward some larger <coughs> values. When the star tracker isn't operating, which is a small fraction of the time, but when it is not, then the um, geolocation is performed with um, the ISS navigation, which is in the broadcast ancillary data, acronym BAD, so make of that what you will. But um, the, you can see there the, the distance um, errors are, um, the distribution is flatter, there are some larger errors seen, and their work is continuing on um, the navigation, um, but this is what will be available in the the provisional data. And then just to briefly compare with Liz, since this is an identical sensor, um, I've um, performed comparisons for just four months of data toward the end of Liz, um, trim Liz lifetime. And you can see that um, here the, um, the temporal errors were about uh, two milliseconds, and this is known. Uh, Philip Bitzer had a paper um, that addressed this issue. Um, and as far as distance offsets, trim was also seeing about five to six kilometers. So there's um, comparable performance and um, Again, there's still work ongoing on Liz. Um, this is the only slide I'm going to show of data from the current GLM um, operational environment because for the reasons I mentioned earlier um, and, and Sam went into, um, this will be imp improving um, in the, the data that's becoming available now. But um, the temporal offsets that we're observing are about uh, a millisecond and a half 
um, when comparing to the ground-based networks and that's compared to the two millisecond integration window. Uh, and the correction to uh, the origination time of the lightning is, is also still something that is um, in progress. Um, for distance offsets um, for all groups, um, that curve is shown, uh, that curve is shown here in black. And then I'm also showing distance offsets for just groups near the edge. And so those are at least 6,000 kilometers from the center of the, um, of the, the nadir position. Um, and the absolute values here um, are, are not the point. The point is that for the edge groups, the, um, there's a much broader distribution and um, much larger distance errors. And that's something that I'll be um, focusing on with this next data set, which is the reprocess data. Um, this is from the ER2, uh, during the ER2 flights during the field campaign was reprocessed. It has the best available geolocation to date. It's about 65 hours worth of data. Um, and so the same plot for that data uh, shown here, you can see that the distance offsets are, are much tighter, um, about three kilometers for all groups and then uh, larger errors when you consider groups near the edge. Um, the uh, latitude and longitude offsets are shown at the bottom and you can see there's kind of a hemispheric pattern, um, north versus south in the latitude offsets and um, east versus west in the longitude. Um, so plotting that um, more graphically, um, you can see the, the mean distance errors plotted in colors here and then the vectors give a representation of the latitude and longitude offsets. So this is how the GLM groups would have to be shifted in order to best match up with the ground-based networks. And so you can see that they need to be shifted outward, especially near the limb. There's this inward shift in the GLM data. Um, and this is due to the uh, assumptions in the geolocation with the lightning ellipsoid. So the current lightning ellipsoid assumes that GLM sees lightning at cloud top, uh, which is approximated by 16 kilometers of the equator sloping down to six kilometers of the poles. Um, the issue here, of course, is that when um, for groups um, further from the center, GLM is actually seeing lightning from the side that's represented here. Um, so the, um, it's not actually seeing lightning at cloud top, but rather from the side. And so um, a lower lightning ellipsoid height is needed for groups at the edges of the domain. Um, Clem Tillier very kindly provided a, um, a script that allows us to um, shift um, or re-navigate the GLM groups from their initial uh, latitude and longitude to some other um, new latitude and longitude based on a different lightning ellipsoid. And I'm running out of time here, but I'm just saying um, we'll use two different lightning ellipsoids to date. One is just lowering the lightning ellipsoid everywhere. And then the other is um, allowing the lightning ellipsoid to slope um, from nadir at some value, sloping downward toward the edges um, in terms of longitude and also downward at, um, toward the poles. And um, just very quickly here, I'll, I'll note that um, at the top, you're seeing what happens if we just lower the ellipsoid everywhere. So we're sloping down from 13 kilometers at the equator to four kilometers at the poles, and um, the distance errors are um, becoming smaller. You can see that the, the distribution of distance errors is shifting towards smaller values when we do that. Um, and that is actually being um, implemented into the, um, the data processing. All right, I will leave conclusions up and take your questions. Thank you. So we have time for a question. Steve? Can you, um, did you do a, a straight comparison uh, between ISS data classes and the ground class data set that I saw on the slide deck? The reason I ask mm -hmm. is that um, there's a difference between the, the distance between the two groups of 6.5 kilometers versus 6.5 Um, I do not have a sense. I haven't looked at um, trying to cluster the flashes together into to elements like that. So, um, yeah, I, I don't have a, an answer that based on the data. Right. Yeah, I think um, there are others also who are looking at um, clustering the flashes together and seeing how they behave with, um, in that way. So that is, I think that work is ongoing. Okay. Let's thank our speaker again.
next speaker is uh, Ron Q. Swan from uh, the Chinese Meteorological Agency, and he's going to talk about their new uh, 2094 geostationary satellite with a liquid as a white moon. Thank you, Chair, and uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Fu Xiang Huang from China. Uh, I'm glad to, to talk on the Latin mapping image on the FY48 satellite and the typical application experiment using the LIM data. Uh, first, I will give a short introduction about the LIM on the FY48 satellite. And uh, here, a uh, typical application experiment using the LIM data. This part, I'll give a, uh, have a talk uh, in, in little detail. And uh, three conclusions and a uh, short summary. Uh, the f a satellite, the first one of Chinese second generation uh, geostationary meteorological satellite was successfully launched on December 11, 2016. As one of main pillars on the FFA, the Latin mapping image is Chinese first Latin detector in space. The LIMI uh, uh, FFA has a regional coverage with two small CCDs. So in the future, we hope the LIMI on the FYFRC will have a four disk coverage. And uh, this figure shows the coverage of the uh, LIMI. Uh, the LIMI will observe the north hemisphere in months after the spring equality and uh, observe the south hemisphere in months after the autumnal uh, equality. So, so sometimes, uh, in, in, I mean, uh, in in lost uh, in lost hemisphere sense, uh, in in months, the limit will observe the lost hemisphere. And, uh, in the winter months, it will observe the south hemisphere. Uh, during the 2017 Chinese uh, flood period, the limit observed many uh, thunderstorms over China. Among these, the deep convec uh, convective event during April 8th to 9th over the middle and the lower reaches of Yonge River is a typical one. So today I'm glad to, to, give, a, uh, uh, to give an example of uh, the typical application of the limit data. In this uh, study, we used the uh, following data. Uh, first, the limit event data in one minute data set. And second, the uh, meteorological station precipitation observation data, including hourly and uh, cumulative, uh, cumulative data. And the uh, three, ground-based lightning observation from the Chinese ground lightning location network. First, we calculated the thunderstorm tracks and the tried to monitor track, track movement during the convection. And uh, we also monitor the thunderstorm at, uh, at a different stage in, in real time. This figure shows uh, the development and uh, the movement of the thunderstorm um, tracks during the, during the uh, convection. And the thunderstorm started at, at, at this place at 10 uh, on 8, and it moved uh, towards the southeast. And at this time, a uh, separate uh, 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 thunder uh, thunderstorm uh, de developed from here uh, in this direction, and another one from here to this to this place. Uh, and this figure shows uh, some e examples of the real-time uh, monitoring of thunderstorm uh, to different stages. And uh, this one shows the beginning stage, and, uh, and this one shows the moment, uh, moment stage. 
In this one of uh, first, uh, the moment and developing, develop, uh, developing stage of the sunstorm, yeah. This one shirt, the styling of the stage. We also cut out, uh, calculated the, the precipitation track during and after the convection using station precipitation of the data over the region. And then we compare the distribution of lightning activity in the precipitation track. Uh, this, this figure is ju uh, ju just the show. And the, and the, the other one is the, uh, the other one is the distribution of the precipitation. The tracks of these two tracks, uh, uh, these two tracks are quantitative consistent, but uh, we, we can also see there exists some differences, especially in this area, uh, in these areas. These two figures shows the, uh, is the comparisons of the distribution of the accumulated uh, uh, lightning activities and this one shows the uh, accumulated precipitation during and after the uh, convection. Analysis shows that the precipitation in the event is triggered by the convection, but then develops into a straight form precipitation. And this uh, partly uh, explains the, the differences in exist, these two tracks. Uh, to evaluate the correct list of linear observation, the lightning uh, location of accuracy we cut out a great deal of comparisons between the linear and the ground-based observation at uh, every minute. And uh, here is a, a, a example to show the comparison of the linear observation and the ground-based observation. The comparison show the correct list of linear observation and data location accuracy less than one linear pixel in data. Uh, we also got the variation process of lightning activities uh, during the convection using the uh, linear and the ground-based observation. The, very, uh, the variation ratio of uh, inter-cloud uh, lightning, inter-cloud lightning to cloud ground lightning during the convection is roughly in this figure, we can see this, uh, this line uh, is, the data, uh, is the data from the lightning uh, observation, uh, li from the linear observation. Uh, this figure shows the, uh, the variation process from the beginning to, to the end of the uh, convection. And what you see, uh, and this, uh, the numbers of the, of the linear observation To some extent, to to, uh, to stand for the uh, total lightning in uh, during the convection, and the red one is the data from the ground base observation, and these two lines uh, share the the uh, the variation process of the uh, of the uh, inter uh, IC and the CG. Uh, and uh, in, in the f uh, from this figure, we can also see the linear observation is one hour earlier than ground-based observation. And the number uh, variation of the lightning is 10 uh, for linear and the ground-based are quite different. And the variation, uh, the, the variation of ratio of IC to CG or IC to total, total lightning make liquid precipitation. And uh, like to give a, 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 a little, uh, a small conclusion. Uh, first, a uh, great deal of uh, data comparisons show the correct list of uh, linear lightning observation and linear event location accuracy is less than one linear pixel in data. And uh, the data application experiment shows the linear has the capacity of monitoring and chasing deep convection over China in real time. Just I'll give a short summary. First, the linear uh, on FYFA is the first Chinese steel Latin linear with a regional convection uh, tolerance. Uh, we will have a four disk tolerance on the FYFA C. And the primary result 
sure the correct, correct list of Latin observations and statistics of real-time monitoring is convincing for safety. And uh, uh, we cut off the great deal of data convergence between the geo Latin imager and the ground based, and we found the ground based uh, observation is much different from static Latin observation. So, with uh, in my opinion, observations from the list on the international space uh, space station are much better, are much better data source for data convergence than static Latin observation. In the, uh, in the future, we have much work to do with linear encoding, location improvement, population variable statistic, data comparison, and classification. So today, uh, we call uh, all kinds of collaboration on geolatin image. Thank you. Our next presentation will be observational use of geostationary lightning mapping data. And Scott uh, will ask the witness to come forward. of me here because it's so dark over here and I wanted to be able to find me later. Um, <laughs> so my, my role really is uh, I work with NESDIS STAR and that's it's a branch of NESDIS that works on the transition of research to operations and so really my role is to understand the instrument and then understand the users and try to kind of be a liaison between those two different groups. And so what I did today is I just wanted to kind of show some examples of the operational applications for the geostationary lightning mapper data put the outline slide here mainly to show you this pretty picture that Michael Peterson created for us. Uh, on the, the right there you'll see this is just a snapshot during uh, the active hurricane season and uh, this makes a terrific desktop background and so and if anybody wants it just reach out to me and, and I'd be happy to share it with you. Uh, so but like I said I don't really have to define the GLM because the previous speakers did such a good job of that. So really I'll focus on the imagery examples and the operational applications and then mention the GLM web page because that's under development. So all of this stuff's been shown before. One thing I want to show is in this animation that you see on the right here, this is a, one of the original ones that Lockheed created for the group. And this is using the GLM background and the obviously the GLM events. And as this circles back around, you can kind of see this is not in not as much detail as the previous animations that you saw. But just last week, Steve pointed out to me that this was during one of our laser beacon tests. And so as this animation loops back around, uh, look right over the DC area, and you'll see a, a brightening right there. That's our laser beacon, one of the CalVal tools that we use. And so it's just kind of neat. It, it, it was designed to make it into the level two data and so that we can use it for a lot of different applications. All the other stuff here I think you've seen uh, on, in various forms. So this is an important slide. It's, it's one of the few that I have without pictures, but it's one of the most important. The, the, really the uses of the GLM, one of the main focus in the selling point has been its relation to severe weather, the idea of identifying lightning jumps preceding severe weather. But there really are a lot of other ap operational applications. And so the, one of the main ones is just to detect the ele electrically active storms, the idea, I, idea that IC flashes precede the CGs. And so total lightning, you can see it quicker. The second one that I have listed there, determine the aerial extent 
of the lightning threat. And this is one that has an immediate impact. I was out at the Aviation Weather Center a few weeks back, and they're rethinking the distance that flights need to stand off from storms because their previous data sets mainly showed the convective cores and the cloud to ground flashes. Now that the GLM shows this full spatial extent, they're rethinking how far you need to stay away from these electrically active storms. The idea of track, tracking convective cells that are embedded in larger features, we used to only be able to do that over, out over the oceans when you had microwave overpasses. And now we're able to see through the cirrus shield and really understand um, the, the strengthening and weakening of these storms that are embedded in there, and then also we can monitor the convective mode and the storm evolution. So we've actually been able to see supercell thunderstorms out over the ocean, and uh, kind of the splitting of storms and the favoring of the right mover and all that stuff. So it's very, very interesting. That goes right along with the next two here, supplementing the radar data uh, where the coverage is poor, for instance, out west, and then also monitoring convection as it transitions offshore outside of the radar domain over CONUS. The, the, the second to last one there, distinguishing the thunderstorm from the rain over only areas, this is really important in, in an automated sense to try to improve our quantitative precipitation estimates, to have a better idea where the convective storms are and then where the stratiform precipitation is. And so in the future, this will be worked in and help improve the GOZAR uh, precipitation algorithm. And the last one I put there, providing insights into tropical cyclone intensity changes. As many of you know, over the years of research, there's been a mixed signal in terms of what the lightning provides on the tropical cyclones. And a lot of us in the community are very excited now that we'll have this total lightning information. And so we'll, we, f we feel like we, we will have much clearer signals uh, in tropical cyclones. I don't need to go through all the details here because we've gone over them, but I wanted to show this example of a Liz flash. This isn't a GLM flash, but the reason I showed this, what you'll see is that the brightening of the pixels, those are the events. This is one exceptional Liz flash that lasted almost a second. And what you're seeing, the, the line is connecting all of the groups within this flash. And so I show this really to make the point that the, the geostationary lightning mapper is indeed a mapper and not a detector. The idea that we can see some very fine structure in the lightning flashes, and, and I show this to forecasters because they really fixate on the eight by eight kilometer resolution. And I, I'd like to kind of get the point across that think more about the two millisecond resolution and the detail that we can uh, uncover from these storms. So the, the definitions of these have already been given, so I won't go into detail, but the idea we have events, groups, and flashes. One of the first questions we get when we show forecasters why do we need all three of these? And so I put this point on the end here, the idea that GLM flash rates are most closely tied to the updraft strength and the evolution of the storm, and so they should be used in, for instance, lightning jump applications. The events, though, do a much better job of depicting the spatial extent of the lightning. And then the, the groups are most similar to the ground-based uh, network strokes and pulses. And so the first implementation with the weather service is going to combine the best of both worlds and we're going to have what's called a, a flash extent density. And so it'll have the, the accuracy of a lightning flash count, but it'll also depict the full spatial extent. This is, uh, we mentioned the ground system. So the, there's the instrument and then there's the ground system. And really the ground system has been developing and improving over time to accurately represent what we uh, expect out of the instrument. And so I've showed it on the uh, DO4, was really the big one. So this is the first time the ground system was providing data that, that was intelligible, that we could actually use. Before then, we had to rely on uh, reprocessed data. Then on, on, uh, the, on Halloween of this year, at 1722 UTC, this fix went in and it, it fixed what the uh, weather service had come to call Charlie Brown stripes. And I made the image yellow here so you could see why they call it that. Um, but this is, this is just, it was fixed as part of a, a ground system update, and it, I just showed the pictures here to show you an example of, of these things that we're correcting over time. The, the really big one, though, we mentioned the Halloween update, but this update that's been referenced on the 28th of uh, November, this was really a, a, a big deal because we removed what were called the radiation dots, so there was some speckling, some uh, non-physical lightning events. We had what were called duplicative events, and then we, to get this in, in the uh, ground system before we did the drift and then an upcoming freeze during the GOES-S uh, period, we had to cut off the image navigation fixes. And so it's, it's been indicated that probably 70% of what we wanted to do to fix the image navigation and registration made it into this update. And so once, once, these, uh, once we have about seven days of data following today, uh, we'll have a much better feel uh, for, for how 
how this improved the location accuracy. And then the next big upgrade to the update to the ground system is, is planned for June of 2018. And to get things in here, we're looking at the March timeframe. I put in a, this here, I've, I've just started, the community really wanted to know when these changes were going into effect and what, what effects these changes had. And so I started to draft this document and I, I put it up on our CalVal team's uh, website. It really just goes through and it describes which of these work um, work requests are, are implemented in each of these builds and it helps to advise the community as to what they should be looking for uh, before and after certain dates and so if if you'd like to uh, obtain this it's on our website lightning.umd.edu and it's under the GLM validation tab and so now to the pretty pictures this is a uh, an animation that Michael Peterson created and and really this is is not a quantitative it's more qualitative and it's it's meant for situational awareness and so what we're showing here that's Hurricane Irma and this is the not the GLM backgrounds anymore this is the ABI channel 13 infrared I wanted to point out just about right here when it starts interacting with Cuba you see it's completely ringed with lightning and this is really the first time I'd seen this maybe others had uh, but it's it's really exciting to have these data and to really see how they uh, how they are relative to the tropical system. And then here, this is jumping a couple days forward. This is uh, Hurricane Maria. And you can see, again, a lot of lightning. And when we talk about the tri tropical cyclone intensity changes, we look at the uh, ratio of the lightning in the inner core versus the outer rain bands. And that's really what's been used to, to try to anticipate whether we're going to have rapid intensification of a tropical system. So you can see the brightening of the pixels are the GLM events. And then the yellow that you see, those are lines connecting the groups within individual flashes. And so this is just one example of a display that we could show uh, and maybe just put on a screen so the forecasters can see which storms are becoming electrically active. Here's another way to look at it. Nobody said lightning had to be yellow, so in this case, lightning is pink. And we pause it here, and here comes an overpass from a microwave instrument. This is from the SUMI MPP, and then you can see it fade. And one possible application of this is the forecasters out over the oceans, they get these microwave snapshots, but they're really left wanting more. And so what we're thinking is you can actually use the lightning data to extrapolate this forward and backward in time and provide a forecaster with the ability to wheel backwards and wheel forwards with their microwave observations. And so that's a pretty neat image there, but really to get a cool animation, you have to bring three dimensions in. And so that's what this animation does. This is Patrick Myers, a colleague of mine at the Cooperative Institute for Climate and Satellites in Maryland. And you'll see now he, he pulls off of the plan view, and you can really start to see some texture in here. And so we're really excited to start combining these different data sets and, and getting a, a much better idea of how um, the lightning relates to these uh, convective features. So when we talk about the NWS applications, one really important thing to note is they work in the AWIPS software. And so anything we do has to make it into AWIPS for a forecaster to be able to use it. Uh, and so that's a challenge for the community. I've already mentioned some of these, the idea of lightning jumps, lightning safety, the idea that the GLM provides more than just point observations, and then situational awareness. Throughout the GOES field of view, we now have an ability to monitor this rapidly uh, evolving convection. And efforts really can continue to develop the best tools for the forecasters, and on the bottom left there, that's fake data, but what, this is from 2013, what we're showing is the, the red line's hard to see, but you'll see a rapid increase right about now in the south of DC. You'll see a rapid increase or brightening, and then about 20 minutes later, there's a tornado. And the same thing happens in the, uh, this, the event above it. On the right here, this is how we envision the GLM data will be used four or five years from now, the idea that we'll have GLM storms. So the trim Liz had a parent to flashes. Uh, the GLM doesn't, but we're gonna create them, and it's really gonna give the forecasters the ability to, to query the storms and, and really get the full uh, advantage that the GLM can provide. When you develop tools for the forecasters, you really need to have training, and it's a, a wide variety of training. This right here is an example of a quick guide, so this is just a reference guide for forecasters. This doesn't take the place of formal training. So they have formal training, but then this is provided so that they have kind of a quick reference so they don't have to go back to that formal training to, to get quick answers. And then future applications. This here, this is from Liz, and so it could be one of two things. It could be either a meteorite or it could be a high energy particle. It probably is a meteorite. We won't have that ambiguity, or amb ambiguity with the GLM because it has a filter that will filter out the high energy streaks. And so going back to the question earlier, they say that all of the, uh, the bolides that have been detected by the uh, 
government network has been seen by the GLM too, and so it's really exciting for that community as well. AGU presentations, if you missed Michael Peterson's poster yesterday, you missed Michael Peterson's poster because he had some really neat stuff to show. Uh, later today, Larissa will be presenting in, a, in an hour or so here. And we mentioned that the data were going to come online today for those who have access to the GRB antenna. It'll come online during Larissa's talk at 9.36 a.m. <laughs> and with that, I wanted to show this is the website that's under development. We have first the uh, top left there, that's just a a snapshot of what the GLM data is doing right now, and then Michael's made it so that we'll have eight predefined spots, and you click on those, and then you get a 3D pan around. You'll be able to see the GLM in a much, uh, just a much more interactive sense. So with that, I'll take any questions. So we have time for uh, a few questions. Yes. Yes. With the... Uh, bringing the other sensors in to get the third dimension, yeah, so bringing the microwave sensors in. Thanks again. Oh, you got oh, one more? Another question. Yeah, but you will. Um, we've seen some examples, and I don't know an exact number of pixels, but we've seen some very large flashes, um, extensive flashes that go back into the stratiform region. So stretching 100 or 200 kilometers back into the stratiform region, those are observed well by the GLM. Yeah. It does. Yep, you're correct. All right, thanks again. All right, thanks again. Okay, yeah, let me also announce uh, Scott just uh, received uh, recognition from, uh, from Noah Nesdis. Uh, we have this award called the David Johnson Award for taking the science into applications, and he was the winner this year. So congratulations. I should probably let you drive your Mac there, right? <laughs> <laughs> if I can get the presentation. Yeah, presentation. Yeah. Did you see it? Front legs number two. It's more difficult to Click switch between Mac. Mac. Uh, PC and Mac it is to launch GLM. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah right. <laughs> but you guys can figure it out. There you go. That you can use this yep. to point. Okay. Thank you. Well, good morning. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to report on some um, work we've been doing in Colorado, um, mainly centered around the CalVal program uh, that UAH and Marshall conducted um, involving the ER2 and, and other instrumentation. And we had um, a day in early May um, where the ER2 flew to Colorado, and um, it was quite a... Uh, uh, gold mine of a day, uh, um, if you like. And I'll be reporting on some of those observations here today. And in the parenthetic statement there, I'm going to leave the Colorado area. I'm going to go to the tropics uh, near the end where we recently completed a, a long cruise on the Roger Ravel uh, with a polymetric radar and me measuring some thermal dynamic properties of the atmosphere. And I want to talk a little bit about GLM lightning context, uh, GLM in the context of that, of that field campaign. Right. So um, the CalVal program, as I said, on, on the 8th of May was an uh, extreme gold mine day. The ER2 was overhead for about three hours, um, flying over the CSU Chio uh, polymetric dual wavelength radar, as well as the Northeast Colorado uh, LMA network. And um, <clears throat> um, this day was very interesting. We had both uh, normal polarity storms with mid-level negative charge and the um, so-called anomalous storms that frequent the Colorado Eastern Plains where uh, we have uh, enhanced low-level positive charge. 
And as you, if you caught Brody's talk on uh, Monday, there's, there's some distinct differences in, in the lightning flash rates in the areas and the uh, median flash channel altitudes uh, between normal and inverted polarity storms. And I like to sort of uh, place this in, in the uh, context of the GLM observations. I'm going to look at just a snapshot of the data here uh, today from two convective storms that <clears throat> the Earth 2 overflew. So a little bit about methodology. What we're doing here is we're, trying, we're taking the uh, radar indicated area is indicated by 35 dBZ and we're attributing uh, LMA and GLM, GLM flashes to that, that outline of the 35 dBZ. Um, <clears throat> what we're trying to do, uh, we have a clustering algorithm that we apply to the LMA data. Uh, it's based on the um, distance between individual VHF sources, both in time and space. And what we did here uh, to sort of try to normalize the LMA flash rates with respect to the GLM flash rates is that we use very conservative distances between um, VHF sources of 16 and a half kilometers um, <clears throat> to provide a contiguous flash. Normally we use three kilometers in the flash algorithm. And we also use 330 milliseconds within the time between individual VHF sources to be um, uh, contained within a single flash compared to 150 milliseconds. So we're using this based on the um, algorithm that GLM uses, where, as it's been reported, we have events, groups, and, um, and flashes. Events are two millisecond pixels. Groups are uh, the contact of individual two millisecond uh, pixels in that same time frame, either at the vertices of the squares or uh, along their, one of their linear dimensions. And then the groups are collected into flashes when they follow this 330 millisecond and 16.5 kilometer uh, criteria. So <clears throat> what we're going to do then is, is try to look at um, the flash rates as a function of time between GLM and LMA. And I think we should keep in mind that these are very different uh, detection methodologies here. The LMA detects VHF burst radiation. Of course, the GLM detects optical emissions. So a direct comparison between is, is perhaps a bit dubious, but um, we do um, try to, to uh, keep in mind that we're, we're looking at what GLM is telling us is, is a flash rate and what LMA is telling us a flash rate. We want to compare those, those things. So with that in mind, we're going to look at the first storm in Greeley. This was a very strong storm. Uh, it was situated very close to the chill radar. You can see the... Um, um, let me see if this mouse is awake. Yes. Here's the hail core here. Uh, if I showed you differential reflectivity, you would see an area depressed um, uh, near zero ZDR here, um, indicating a, a hail shaft. It's a very strong storm. It has a tremendous uh, vertical development, 50 dBZ extending well into the middle and upper troposphere. Um, it's kind of a garden variety strong storm in, in Colorado. Now, on this plot here, on the left, is a VHF source density as a function of time. We're looking about an hour worth of data here. So if you recall, um, the positive charge is, uh, is, is follows the, the uh, strong VHF source density. So this is clearly an anomalous storm with positive charge near down about six kilometers MSL. On the right is the vertical reflectivity structure. You can see again how strong it is. There's at times where 65 dBZ is extending up to uh, about eight kilometers. It's a very, very intense hail bearing storm. This is just a time height cross section of peak reflectivity. So keep that in mind. Now we're going to turn to the inner comparisons here. Um, so these plots are going to be duplicative for a couple of cases. Above in green is the LMA flash rate. The axis is on the left. You can see peak flash rates in excess of 200 per minute. Uh, the GLM is in the magenta curve on the bottom, and the so-called detection efficiency is the ratio of the GLM flash rate and LMA flash rate as a function of time. And you can see for this case that the detection efficiency ranges between about 0.1 and 0.2. Um, the other thing that's of interest here is that the LMA flash rate has a lot of dynamic range, but the GLM um, does not it's more uh, uniform as a function of time. It doesn't show these large fluctuations in flash rate. The other thing that's of interest is that the largest detection efficiencies 
that are, whoop, it's kind of compact up here. We got to go back. Okay, uh, this mouse is, there's not a lot of work, area to work here. These areas right here, local maximums in tax efficiency occur during periods of reduced LMA flash rate. So I want you to keep that in mind. Down below are the events and the groups and the flash rates. And you see there's quite a bit of dynamic range in the, um, in the events and the groups, but less so in the flashes. So GLM is seeing lots of optical energy from this storm. Now, this plot here <clears throat> is quite interesting. We're estimating the mean flash area based on Eric Bruning's um, convex hull methodology, and we're also estimating the mean median flash height. So what we're doing here for an individual flash is we're looking at the centroid of the VHF source density, and then for multiple flashes during that time window, we're taking the median net value and calling that the median flash altitude. So on the left, you can see that the detection efficiency seems to track with flash area pretty well. Um, and the detection efficiency is very low um, from the center of the plot to the end of the plot, even during a period of time where the flash altitude is higher. But these flash altitudes are still pretty low, characteristic of anomalous storms in Colorado. Now, another storm that was quite interesting is the Denver hail storm. The ER2 arrived just after the big hail fell out. It damaged um, uh, shopping malls, it obliterated many new cars. There was just a shopping mall two weeks ago that opened up again. It was in um, uh, late November and it was closed on the 8th of May when this storm hit. So it did tremendous amount of damage. This storm was really interesting. It started off with normal polarity, with mid-level positive, upper level, or mid-level negative, upper level, and lower level positive. Then it transitioned into this beast of an anomalous storm where all the sources were down low. <clears throat> so let's keep this in mind. Now, the flash rates in this case for the Denver hail storm, you can see that early on the det detection efficiency was fairly high, and then it plummeted during the anomalous phase of the storm. The whole view of the storm later from about halfway to the end of the panel was very muted. There's very few sources, um, uh, very, few, uh, very few events, rather, very few uh, groups, et cetera. But the flash rates are, are admittedly low at that time. But here's an interesting result here. On the left, again, is the median flash area. On the right is the median flash altitude. The detection efficiencies here appear to be highest when the median flash altitude is high. And then as the median flash altitude comes down when the storm flips into anomalous mode, the detection efficiencies are considerably lower. So we've looked at only two cases right here, and it's just impossible to say what the overall role is in flash area and, and median flash height in contributing to detection efficiency. So what we did, we appealed to the LIS data set as a proxy for GLM, and we looked at multiple overpasses over a decade over the Alabama um, LMA, courtesy of Rich Blakesley and colleagues, and we simply have plotted uh, when we snap the LIS and LMA to a grid, we can then associate LIS flash rates with um, LMA flash rates. And you can see here that for small flashes, detection efficiencies are rather low. The solid black line is the CDF of, fl of median flash uh, um, area, and about 50% of the flashes are smaller than 10 square kilometers. And you can see that for those flashes, the detection efficiency is only high when you're near the top of the cloud. As we move to the right, we get larger flashes associated with MCSs and things like that. And you can see that um, the detection efficiency grows, it increases with increasing flash area, regardless of flash altitude. So those are the bigger flashes. Then we got data from Don McGorman and colleagues, and it looks almost the same. You see the same trend here. Um, Compact flashes have lower detection efficiencies. Large flashes have um, high detection efficiencies regardless of their height within the overall cloud. Next, what we want to do is we want to segregate these cases by normal and anomalous polarity. We want to look at MCS and non-MCS and try to get a feel for this. But this has been a, a really interesting exercise. 
So finally, I'm going to take an excursion to the tropics in the last minute. Up above, on the upper left, is the Roger Ravel, operated by Scripps. And we built a five centimeter polymetric radar, and we took it out on the 16th of October, returned to port on November 17th. We sailed down to the East Tropical Pacific. This is an area of great interest to the oceanographers. In the upper right panel is the ocean salinity. And you can see reduced salinity that sits in the area of the high SST and intertropical convergence zone. And the freshening is associated with rainfall and some horizontal advection of lower saltier water. And they want to understand this, this problem, but we had a great opportunity to look at oceanic convection. <clears throat> so here's a picture on the 24th and 25th of October, ABI data, and um, the ship location is in the gold diamond. And you can see the flashes here. Every once in a while, we got these rogue flashes, and we eliminated single event flashes in this data set. But during the day, uh, there's about an eight hour offset here between Greenwich and local time. So um, um, during the daylight hours, occasionally we see these rogue flashes in areas where there's no cold cloud. And I I, of course, I think that's being understood and being worked on. But one of the things that we did for analysis is we looked at a time series of the convective available potential energy from four soundings per day from the ship. We overplotted that with, um, um, I should have put my glasses on for this, but <laughs> uh, you can see the cape um, in, the, uh, in the blue and the SST in the green, and then the GLM flash rate in black. And we followed a technique that Peterson and I, uh, Walt and uh, I and Dick Arville did uh, years ago in the lower right from Toga Core. We plotted um, the cape at a point from the ship, and then a five degree by five degree box around that, we summed up the lightning. And you can see early on, we had very high cape, we had a lot of lightning. When the cape fell to below about 1500, we had very, uh, few uh, lightning events. So it's consistent with what we saw in Toga Core. But in this area of the ocean, there's probably very little CCN fluctuations. We're well away from shipping lanes. We're well away from land. We didn't see a ship for about three and a half, four weeks uh, at sea. Uh, we saw a lot of mahi-mahi fish being caught and sharks and a lot of rain, but no pollution sources. So this is quite fascinating. So here's just an example. And um, you can see I'm just about done. Thanks, Steve. Um, this is on early in October, the High Cape event. We could see this, this convective structure here, and I call this the Peterson Rule. Walt came up with this one uh, back in the day when he was a student. 35 dBZ extends to minus 10 or colder. Um, he had some other interesting um, terminology, too. Uh, tons of lightning and tons of rain he used. Um, that's a standing joke in the group. <laughs> but anyway, um, later on when the Cape was high, you can see that the clouds are deep, but they have no vertical reflectivity structure. And this is pretty well understood. So in conclusion, the GLM detection efficiencies appear to be impacted by both flash size and flash channel heights. Anomalous storms feature high flash rates, compact flashes, and low flash channels. And these may present particular challenges for GLM, especially in lightning jump detection and things like that. And finally, GLM observations over tropical oceans may serve as a proxy for thermodynamic conditions. And I'd like to conclude by thanking Steve Goodman for his support and NASA and NSF for providing support to get us out to sea in spurs. And moreover, um, I'd like to thank um, many other people. I can't name them all, but of course Lockheed and, and Hugh Christian uh, was pioneering efforts for many years and Rich and, and many, many people have brought this, this marvelous opportunity to us scientists in, in the form of GLM. And we're, we're really um, grateful to, to have this opportunity to work with this exciting data. Thank you. Questions for Steve? Eric. Some of the oceanic lightning impacts have been reported to be greater in depth and larger in some way at high size. Have you seen any evidence of that in the Earth observations? Oh, we haven't looked at the flash power in that, but that's something that we could go, go back and, and take a look at. Um, one of the interesting things that, and Ed Zipser reported this and, and Sarah's talk, is that the lightning appeared to be forming in, in, in clusters, large clusters, preferentially compared to smaller systems. And in the East Tropical Pacific, the only lightning we saw was from deep isolated stuff. So that was, that was quite, quite fascinating. But it's just a snapshot look at the data set. There's a lot more to do.
Thanks. Okay. All right. Thanks, Steve. Thank our speaker again. So our next talk is uh, combining GOES 16 geostationary lightning mapper with the ground-based Earth Network's total lightning network, and uh, Michael Stock will be presenting. So uh, that's a, a long title. Uh, you can shorten it quite a lot and say combining GLM and ENTLN. Um, so I kind of want to talk about this thing that we've been doing for a while. Uh, we're not quite finished with it, but the goal here uh, is to kind of take these two systems and merge them. So what I'm not going to do uh, is I'm not going to actually talk about a comparison between the stations. Uh, Jeff LaPierre did that yesterday. Katrina Burtz was talking about that today. And instead, I'm going to try and do something a little bit different. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at these uh, GLM groups. We're going to take a, a group, and then we're going to assume that the current that is producing our light in, uh, that we're detecting from space should also be producing some kind of electric field spheric, and that hopefully we can actually detect that electric field spheric at a ground station. So what we want to do is we want to take those two things, we want to put them together, and then we want to try and see if we can't say something more about the group that we are looking at. So why would we want to do this? Well, we have a couple of things that we might want to look at. One of them is uh, identifying um, false events, uh, either from the ground-based network or from uh, space. Essentially, if both networks see it, then it's more likely to be real. Um, Another one is that the ground-based network can provide some things that the space-based network doesn't, such as peak current and classification, and the space-based network can do things like flash area a lot better than the ground-based network can. So you can kind of sort of get the best of both worlds. Um, and then, in addition, uh, the current source uh, point location can be more accurately located than 10 kilometers in most areas, and so we can, th we should be able to do something along the lines of improving location accuracy in certain situations. So that's the idea. Um, here's the coverage. This is GLM. Um, this is pretty well known. It covers most of the Americas pretty well. This is in its current location as of you know, a few weeks ago. It's moved now. Uh, the ENTLN coverage looks like this uh, currently as of November 15th. This is really just looking at the number of stations in each, each location. Anywhere it's green there is more than 15 stations within 500 kilometers. And so we're going to start this looking at, you know, kind of the area that we know what to do with, uh, which is right here over the Americas because uh, we'll start with what we know. Uh, and I'm going to look at data from October 15th. And so this is a storm that happened on October 15th. The GLM data is changing with time. This is not on the most recent data. I have not looked at that yet. Uh, so there are some errors uh, in the GLM portion of things that are being corrected. Uh, for the most part, that doesn't affect us too much. And then specifically, I'm actually going to only look at one 20-second chunk of data that I'm going to be showing you guys today. And that happened at uh, 4.15.40 UT, uh, with the goal here uh, being that um, we had some lightning in a lot of different areas uh, of the United States all at the same time. So this means I need to talk about, uh, in this, this data set, we have uh, ENTLN all by itself located 312 uh, lightning strokes or pulses. And then in the data set from GLM, we have 962 groups. So what are we going to do? Um, I'm going to take a group location, and then I'm going to use that as an initial guess. That gives me a time and a location, basically. And that allows me to look up the uh, electric field spherics that uh, Earth networks identified at the same time. And then if we can, we're going to locate those spherics. And if, even if we can't locate them, we should be able to classify those um, spherics. But I'm not actually going to talk about classification today. Which brings me into matching criteria. So if we have a GLM group, that group is being dispersed up and through some, some cloud. There's some you know, scattering and so on and so forth. We really should expect that our event is right on top of the group inside the, the boundary. But right now, we can't do that. And so I'm using a 75-kilometer um, range requirement. 
That's the same that Katrina was using. Similarly, we do the same thing in time. Um, our current search um, requirement in time is plus or minus four milliseconds. That's actually pretty big, and it means that if we have one ENTLN spheric, it can match multiple GLM groups, um, usually not the other way around. And then I'm going to do this kind of in steps. So all of these colors are going to kind of continue through the rest of the presentation. Uh, the first thing we need to have is we need to have some stations that are kind of nearby the group that we're looking at. If we do not have at least two stations within 500 kilometers, I'm going to say we can't say anything about that, that source, and we're going to color them black. Uh, if we do have two stations within 500 kilometers, but we don't see anything, then uh, there's not a match. Those are red. If we do have a match, but we don't have enough to locate, I want six stations to have seen the thing to be able to locate it. That's yellow. It's probably real. Uh, anything over six is blue. Uh, we should be able to locate it. And then if it is actually locatable, we did locate it, then, and it's within 75 kilometers of the GLM group, those are all green. So if we apply that to the same map that we were looking at earlier, uh, now we have red and black. The black ones I can't say anything about. The red ones here have uh, at least two stations within 500 kilometers of the GLM group. And how that breaks down is we had 962 groups to begin with, and in the red are left uh, 500 detectable groups. If we look over here in uh, Florida, we kind of zoom this in. Um, we have a couple of groups here that I'm going to kind of go through uh, individually. This is one GLM flash. On top there are the GLM groups. Uh, the vertical there is, is uh, energy. And then horizontally, each bar is two milliseconds wide. And then below it in black is the uh, ENTLN spheric um, uh, measurements at the same time. And there's some s interesting stuff here already. At the very beginning, uh, there is some ENTLN spheric stuff going on that GLM doesn't seem to see. And then out here, um, these are measured, are, are labeled as uh, red and yellow. This is part of my own, uh, my own fault. Essentially, ENTLN located those, but we only have like one or two samples per um, detection at that time, and so I didn't really match them correctly, but I think those are locatable. Here's another example, uh, also fairly interesting. It's in about the same place. And so over on the right, those red dots are the stations, the 15 stations that are nearest. Um, here we have an ENTLN spheric that appears to have no associated GLM group. And right before this really bright, uh, bright group here, we have a sort of a slow increase in, in energy, in, in optical energy, and there's no electric field spheric associated with it at all. Uh, I don't know exactly what's going on um, at this point. Uh, and then uh, here's one where something's gone wrong. Um, this is a GLM group that is over land. And the ENTLN spheric that looks like, I, I have no idea what that is. Um, I can tell you that that's not going to locate. And we'll see that here in a second. So if we go back to our map and we look at all of the uh, events that we can detect with um, however many stations we have. It looks all blue because all the yellow is underneath it. Um, we actually have 398 of those 500 have, are detected by more than two stations. And then uh, 344 of them are detected by more than six stations. So most of them are detected by more than six stations. That brings us to location. So now I've made it green. <laughs> Um, you know, you, you run those things through a locator, and then this works. In black here, that's not GLM anymore. That's actually the prod, uh, production locator uh, at Earth Networks. So that's what we would just normally put out. I put that out because in October, there's some systematic offsets, and I want to make sure that I'm actually locating them in the right place. Um, first, I'm going to note that that unusual pulse that I mentioned that we should probably be able to locate is gone. Um, Earth Networks didn't locate it normally, and I didn't locate it this time around either. Uh, in total, and this is a bit of a coincidence, um, I was able to locate 312 of the GLM groups that I tried to match. And if we go ahead and take a look at some of these, uh, and then in addition, the production locator actually located some of the stuff over the ocean. So right now, 
I'm only searching 500 kilometers out from a station. I require them to be pretty close. It looks like I can relax that quite a lot. So the locations. Um, I'd like to say that these are really good, but they're not as good as I want them to be. Uh, in black, like I said, are the production locations, and in green are the, uh, my, the locations I'm getting from these groups. And the thing to notice there is that the scatter in green is larger than the scatter in black. Um, that means my location accuracy has gone down. We see the same thing over here in Florida. Uh, black has less scatter than the green does. So I have uh, something to kind of figure out on that, and I will eventually get it. Um, in summary, what we had, we started out with 916, uh, 962 groups. 500 of them are detectable. We ended up locating 312. Um, ENTLN alone also located 312, but they were 312 different uh, strokes. Um, this sort of indicates that I need to increase my search radius to try and uh, get out as many as I can. The things to actually take from this are that we are detecting about 80% of the GLM groups if we have stations within 500 kilometers. And if we detect them with more than six stations, then we locate 90% of them. So where are we going from here? Uh, there's a few things left to go. I've already talked about my location accuracy. Uh, it's not high enough right now. Uh, that needs some improvement. I also need to go back and do that metadata, you know, additional uh, work there, so you know, adding peak currents and adding classifications and looking at the the areas and things like this, and then it also looks like there are pulses or ENTLN electric field spherics that are not located by GLM groups, and the reverse, and those should also be added to this set. So um, with that, uh, thank you for your attention. So we have time for a couple of questions. Yes. I'm not sure yet. <laughs> um, you know, a lot of this is me uh, going through a long range detector uh, locator uh, for the first time ever and relearning all of the, the lessons that Earth Networks has learned long ago. Um, at this point in time, I am treating the Earth as elliptical, and it, I hear that maybe if I do this in Cartesian, I'll get better results for some of these nearby sources, but uh, I'm not sure that that's going to work. Um, it's also possible that I have an issue with the, uh, essentially the, the, the solution portion of it, the, the LM reduction algorithm. So. I'll figure it out, but I haven't figured it out yet. Other questions? Well, let's thank our speaker again. Marissa uh, Silva is our next speaker. Go ahead and introduce yourself. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Let's see if the back one works. Okay. Hi, good morning. Uh, first, I'd like to, to thank uh, for the opportunity to present this work and for the Student Ever Grant and also for my collaborat collaborations. So today I'm going to, ch to show, to present some preliminary results about simultaneous observation of cloud-to-ground lightning with high-speed cameras and uh, GLM. Okay. So this is the outline of this presentation. Um, first I'm going to, sorry. I'm going to talk about the field campaign overview. Um, the goal was uh, recorded simultaneous optical observation from uh, cloud to ground lightning at the ground level with high speed cameras, at the top down view with the GLM. 
um, the campaign was placed at during the summer of uh, 2000, yeah, 2017 at the Washington DC metropolitan area. We put the cameras at the first floor at the U U University of Maryland ASIC building um, at, in College Park. The cameras was uh, pointing, pointing to the east, uh, eastward and uh, uh, the instrumentation. Uh, we used two high-speed cameras uh, set up to work with 2,500 frames per second. And they have uh, had a GPS for uh, synchronized to provide timing, universal time. And the trigger was manually uh, most of time. And when we push, pull the trigger, it saved six, uh, 100 milliseconds before and 1,200 uh, milliseconds are after the trigger. <laughs> Oops. Yeah. What's on the. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. And then the GLM, uh, the spatial resolution uh, is around eight kilometers. The frame rate is around two milliseconds. And uh, as explained before, it provides basically two, three products, events, groups, and flashes, as shown on the picture. Um, and we use the GCLM mapping array uh, to provide uh, location. And uh, the Earth Network's total lighting detection network. Uh, we use uh, the, 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 this data to know the location, uh, also the location and polarity and the, the type of discharge, uh, cloud to ground or intercloud lightning. So the field camping summary, uh, we recorded with the cameras 44 cloud to ground lightnings, and uh, these flashes have uh, had uh, 125 strokes, in, uh, individual strokes. Uh, from these cases, the GLM saw, I can identify uh, or identified with GLM data uh, 25 flashes and uh, from the strokes identified uh, 54 uh, individual strokes. So I'm going to present two uh, stud cases, case studs. Um, for the first one, I have a negative one with 13 return stroke. It happened on uh, June 19th. This is data from the high-speed cameras. <laughs> and also, this is uh, the video made by uh, Michael Peterson with the GLM data for the same case. Looking for the data, uh, he, here I have the, the time of each stroke uh, recorded with the cameras. And all groups uh, which in the flash, uh, the flash, the same flash. And um, the GLM just can, uh, I can just find with GLM data just two um, strokes from these cases. The first one and the fourth one. And they both um, has the mo the bigger uh, uh, peak current. Um, sorry. Sorry. I don't know what was happening. 
sorry. <laughs> okay. How do I? Okay, sorry. Yeah, fix it. <laughs> And then the second case, it was uh, CG. It is a, a positive one with just a single stroke. And this is the GLM data for the same case. Okay. Uh, this one have had uh, 26 milliseconds, uh, the stroke uh, duration, and I can identify the stroke here. So the frame rate of the GLM data is just two milliseconds, so it has uh, many uh, groups on it. And uh, this is yeah, I forgot to show, okay. This is the, the, the time when the stroke happened, and this is ju just to show on the video when the stroke happened. And this is an example uh, how I put things together. So this is this, for this case, this is the stroke location, this is the camera and the blue squares are the event events the yellow square are uh, groups and the green one are the flashes the, f the flash uh, of this case so uh, summary and field filter works um, so I measured optical emission from nature cloud world lightning uh, in Washington DC area uh, with high speed cameras and GLM and uh, we use uh, earth networks and DC LMA uh, to help to get information about the, the sources, the polarity location and uh, high speed cameras record uh, uh, 125 strokes in 44 flashes. The GLM identify 43% uh, of the strokes and 56% of the flashes. And FutureWorks, uh, we are planning to continue getting cases in Brazil with high-speed cameras uh, to compose cases to address several remaining questions. So why does the GLM observe some return stroke and not others? Strokes that uh, the cameras recorded. Uh, does the GLM observe the initial breakdown in CG flashes? Or are there direct relationship between the channel brights and GLM reported, reported regions? And how do clouds property influence uh, this relationship? So that's it. We're a little bit ahead. Do we have any questions? Uh, uh, Ken? Uh, GLM, um, um, whether you were categorizing whether GLM reported mm -hmm. any of those as return strokes or whether it reported any, anything during the impact. Okay, I consider if the GLM saw anything, the, uh, any stroke from a, from a flash, I consider a, a percentage for, for flashes. So, and for strokes, I identify in the individual individually so I have I had 125 and when I put times and location together I can identify um, 40 uh, 54 percent of it uh, 44 43 it, it invid individually
Yes, I just considered uh, the the time and position of uh, as I showed on a last image. Yeah. So. Yeah. So it's the way that I identified the strokes, but. Thank you. Thank you. So our uh, final talk is um, a lightning charge moment changes estimated by high speed uh, photometric observations from ISS. And uh, this will be presented by Yasuhide Obara. I got you good here. Right. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Um, so this work is uh, originally carried out by one of my master's students. Um, so that's graduate now. And uh, the today I'm going to talk about uh, how important the uh, get the electrical property of the lightning uh, by using the optical information, optical information from the space. Okay, so this slide shows the, the energetic lighting produced, you know, how energetic lighting produces T rays. So you know the, the various T rays is shown here. And then uh, in particular, if you look at the sprites, red sprites and the gigantic jet, uh, we have a large charge moment changes. Uh, the community here, everyone know about that. And then uh, the, obviously, so the scientific side to detect the, the energetic lightning uh, is very important, and also uh, not only the scientific side, the engineering side, the energetic lightning, which is very important in the case of the damaging of the electric, uh, modern, uh, modern electrical systems, uh, such as the wind turbine. You know, the, the this is a, this slide shows the the burnt wind turbine blade due to the energetic lightning mainly due to the long-lasting continuing current, which is leads to the very large charge moment, charge moment changes. And then, uh, in particularly, uh, such kind of um, lightning is uh, the lightning with a uh, charge moment change greater than 300, typically greater than 300 coulomb kilometer, uh, 300 coulombs, uh, that damage the wind turbine system. And also, the overhead ground wire, that is a part of the power grid system, which are damaged by the energetic lightning uh, due to the melting, uh, melt due to the heat. Because uh, the, the wire could be, uh, the temperature of the wire could be uh, 10,000 uh, Celsius due to the continuing current. So that is uh, not possible to just sustain. So, uh, so let's move on to the, the detection of the uh, lighting parameter in our modern uh, lighting detection systems. So these are kind of examples. Uh, from the left, uh, we have the ELF measurement system, and then there are two, I showed you two uh, uh, conventional lighting detection, uh, three conventional lighting detection systems. Uh, for example, NLDN, which is covered over the US, and the JTLN, this is uh, the Earth Network's uh, total lighting system recently deployed that uh, over Japan, and the uh, worldwide detection by using VLF frequency range, the Warren. 
Then uh, these lighting systems mainly uh, determine the location and uh, timing and uh, polarity and peak current information. But to de determine the energetic energy of the lightning, uh, we need uh, uh, the ELF measurement is very uh, highly uh, promising. Like you can see in red here. So from the ELF measurement, we can derive the charge moment change uh, along with the polarity. But, ah, sorry, uh, but this kind of measurement system is very much limited in space. For example, the, this ground-based station is not available uh, over the ocean. So that's why detection light deteriorates. On the other hand, if we have satellite, we have basically the uniform detection of such kind of lightning. Uh, for example, say, by using orbiting satellites. And now the geostationary satellites, we have many talks today in this session. Uh, the basically, what we are able to get is a spatial distribution lightning and luminosity uh, uh, obtained. Uh, however, uh, the electrical uh, property of the lightning, optical properties are quite different, and so that's why uh, so far it's very difficult to obtain. So that is why uh, uh, we try to correlate uh, those two parameters. So there's a previous work uh, so far, there are a couple of them. The one of them I picked up was uh, the Adachieto in 2009. Uh, this shows the high correlation, uh, actually uh, greater than the 0 0.94, between the irradiance of the uh, optical, uh, optical observation, emission, optical emission. This is by oxygen line, uh, observed by uh, easier satellite. And ELF uh, transient, uh, uh, sorry, uh, charge moment change uh, due to the uh, ELF measurement on the ground. And you can see the very beautiful uh, correlation here. But they observe, uh, they use only the, the lightning, cloud to ground lightning associated with red sprite travel events. So that's why we not uh, analyze more events, uh, which is uh, which are observed by our GRIMS mission from satellite. So our aim is following that we have the high-speed photometric observation by GRIMS. This is the GEM GRIMS mission, ISS. And we are able to uh, determine the optical irradiance with uh, temporal dependence. And also by the, uh, the integrated irradiance, which is the integration of the optical irradiance by time. And then uh, these parameters compared with ERF measurement, uh, we, we are able to determine the current moment. Uh, uh, that is the product between the current waveforms and the height of the charge lowered to the ground. And then uh, the integration of, uh, by time, the current moment, and we have the lightning charge moment change, QDS. And then we have 160 lightning analyzed, and then uh, make a preliminary statistics. And then try to uh, show the possibility to obtain the electrical property of the lightning based on the optical observation. So uh, let's move on to the observational data. Uh, from the optical observations, we use the GRIMS mission, which is equipped with a photometer, high-speed photometer, and we are able to uh, determine the irradiance. And you can see these photos of the photometers. And uh, the wavelengths, we have six uh, different uh, photometers with different wavelengths, uh, from photometer one to photometer six. And the field of view is shown in the narrow field of views uh, mostly we have uh, except photometer four, which is wide. And the temporal resolution, that is also important, that is uh, 550 microsecond, that is uh, sampling frequency in a 20 kilo. So that means you can see the kind of beautiful uh, wave forms. So on the other hand, electromagnetic wave observations, we have the one station in Hokkaido, Moshiri. Uh, uh, this is the far north of my country. Uh, uh, to avoid any uh, strong electromagnetic interference. So we are, we are able to even determine, detect the lightning from Africa. That's a very, that's a Q burst. So it's a very quiet place, and with summa resonance too. Uh, the frequency range we have up to the thousand hertz, uh, and then uh, we have two horizontal magnetic field components. This time we use that. 
So now let's move on to the uh, distribution of the lightning we analyze. So this is a spatial distribution of the 169 lightning strokes uh, we analyzed. Uh, basically, we focus on the region where the EF station is closer. Well, the Grimms uh, mission uh, they observed the entire Earth. However, we limit the region because even the ELF transient uh, can suffer the propagation effect between the Earth and the ionosphere. So that's why the waveform is distorted. So that's why we better uh, use a region where we have the closer to the, you know, the receiving station the ELF. And then uh, if we break down the, the uh, break down the number of events by polarity of the event, uh, we most we have almost equal number of the events between the positives and the negatives. Well, these are maybe two hypotheses we can determine mean, because normally we have more negatives, but maybe the, due to the propagation, still in propagation effect, uh, or maybe intrinsic uh, effect, intrinsic uh, number of the uh, you know the positive and negative polarity we have uh, such kind of uh, balance. And then uh, this is this also the breakdown number of the lightning events uh, in different photometers. The except photometer one, which is a very short wavelength, we have almost all the events are uh, detected. Mm, a bit difficult to see. Uh, okay, so this is the, it shows the waveforms of the optical irradiance of lightning emission from ISS with different photometer from photometer one, two, three, and four, five, six. Uh, and then uh, when we, once we get the temporal dependence of these photometric, uh, photometric waveforms, and then we integrate over time and then we get the integrated irradiance, that is the unit of joule per uh, square meter, uh, that is shown in the shadow, the red shadow area. Time is okay. Let me just go fast. Yes, okay, thank you. And then uh, this is a comparison between the ELF uh, waveforms, magnetic waveform and photometric waveforms. This is quite similar. And then uh, at that time, in this event, we have uh, the, the image, lightning, scattered lightning image from CMOS camera from Nadia observation. Then if we look at the cross correlation between this uh, uh, irradiance and intensity, uh, intensity of the magnet magnetic waveform, and you can say uh, the very uh, good linear correlation between the two, over 0 0.9. And if we are going to uh, uh, the integrated irradiance and the charge moment change, we still have the linear, co linear correlation between the two, but the correlation bit deteriorate around 0 0.7. Well, but still it's a kind of meaningful uh, uh, difference, uh, meaningful uh, distribution, okay? So uh, this is a summary of a correlation uh, between the uh, different types of uh, polarity. Uh, and then you can see that photometer two and the photometer six has a greater uh, uh, correlation over 0 0.7. Uh, which is uh, which indicate the visible light region in the photometer six and then to the infrared near ultraviolet region. Uh, normally, the absorption is greater here, but uh, the, this is our result so far that we get a great good correlation. So uh, to conclude, uh, we have high a high correlation uh, between the lightning optical irradiance and the current moment chain, and the uh, coincidence relationship are derived. It's a linear relationship, and the rather high correlation, uh, greater than the 0 0.7, was obtained between integrated radiance and light and charge mode change. So that's why, uh, then as a result, we are able to maybe use this kind of methodology to derive the electrical property of the, the lightning, such as ITDS and the charge mode change from photometric measurement. And uh, Certainly, we have the limited, uh, limitation of problems uh, here shown because the time is uh, limited, so I'm just leaving here. And uh, there are several future works, but uh, now we try to get a global map of lighting with such QDS by using this photometric measurement and then try to be uh, compared with a global map from EF transient. Thank you very much. We have time for couple questions.
Yes. Uh, not yet. If it's available, yeah, I'm just uh, very much interested in the data. But the, I can comment on that. The uh, this experiment is no longer on the ISS. Oh, okay. it, oh no, no, not, it, not. It ended, so we didn't overlap. We were hoping to get up there before this mission had completed. Comparison was not that possible, but no, right? <laughs> not, unless you get another one up there. <laughs> Other questions? Well, that's right. Uh, uh, ASIM is going to launch. That's the Atmosphere Space okay. Interaction Monitor is going to be launching in uh, March, and it also has photometers. So I don't know what frequencies. I, and and what? Yeah. So so we may be able to do some some comparisons once ASIM gets launched. All right, uh, let's thank all our speakers. And uh, let me thank uh, my uh, session co-chair, Rich Blakesley, and also our organizers, uh, Scott Redlosky and Tim Lang, if you just throw up your hand uh, <laughs> wherever you are. So the next big event we have is the Franklin Lecture by Hugh Christian, and that's at the Le Nouveau Room. Excuse my French. Uh, <laughs> anyway, head down the hall, and I think it's it's down to the end of the hall, and I suppose there's a coffee break now. Right. So uh, thank at, you uh, all for coming. And that's at 1020.